And let's start off by, will you tell me a little bit about your mom and dad? Well, yes. They were great people. I loved them. I still love them. My father, you know, had hearing problems. And so he had, a, he had some disadvantages because he didn't live where they had wonderful hearing aids like they have now. I remember when he got his first ones, it was quite a, a help to him. And Mother was very ambitious. She uh, always had to have things like wonderful dinners for birthdays, wonderful rugs that she made herself. <laughs> um, she always liked to have things nice and up to date. Um, my father was born in Mesquite, and um, mother was born in Pine Valley. And her sister came down to teach school in Mesquite. And uh, her husband was going on a mission. She just had two little two children. And so mother was going to college, and she was about ready to graduate from college. And uh, my folks talked her into coming down and babysitting the children for Aunt Emma so that Uncle Dave could go on his mission and um, things would go well for all of them. And that's how they happened to be in Bunkerville. She met him and that was, that's who she wanted to meet, was someone like him. And what was your childhood like? What was it like growing up there in that remote little place? Can you describe it for me? You know, I've thought a lot about that, especially as I've grown older. Um, and the girls have said to me, Mother, when you were growing up in Bunkerville, did you ever think you'd get to go and do the things you've done in your life? I said, I didn't think there was anything except Bunkerville, Mesquite, St. George, and Las Vegas. So I... It was fun. It really was a good place to, to grow up. It was especially a good place for me to grow up with my um, hospitalization. You know, they were going to, in St. George, the doctors wanted to cut my leg off. And uh, because of the rallying around, the prayers, the uh, people caring, everyone caring, um, it was a wonderful spot for me to grow up whole. What was the uh, what was the circumstance around the the possible? I had I had osteomyelitis, bone infection, and they were ready to to the point where it was the doctors said it would would come off. In fact, I was in the car with mother with daddy and my uncle Dave going back to Bunkerville after a visit of the doctors. And Daddy said, well, she looks like death herself. I was lying on the back seat. I was kind of raised up to see what death looked like. And um, I, I, I wondered, well, if, if I'm going to die, what am I going to look like then? But it didn't bother me. I, I really wasn't bothered by it. I felt comfortable with my uncle and my father and their prayers, and and it didn't have to happen. How old were you when that happened? Um, I was six years old when it started. When I was seven, it was still it was getting worse, worse, worse. And we found a doctor in Las Vegas who was a very specialized doctor. Though he had never done the surgery, he said, I've studied it a lot, and if you'd like me to try, I will try. Well, money was pretty scarce. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we went ahead and tried, and he did a wonderful job. And the doctors from California, the specialists, would come up to Las Vegas once a week and check all the people that they, you know, had some problems 
that they were concerned about. And so uh, I don't know that I could have had that kind of treatment in other places. They, and and when, this, when the uh, surgery was done, of course, it was... I still had my leg. <laughs> and they were all very happy. There was no shortage of bone. There was... And now everything went well. Yeah, it's kind of miraculous to think of mm -hmm. that working out. So for you as a child, do you recall um, who your friends were and what you liked to do? How did you like to spend your time when you were when you were little? Well, <clears throat> had, you know, we were all pretty much friends, especially all the girls were my friends and. The boys were my friends, and, you know, we did a lot of things together in school. The teachers were strict, but they were very good teachers, and they knew how to handle children. Uh, I always felt they really knew how to handle all the children, and um, they were good teachers. They demanded a lot of respect themselves, and... Uh, it was fun. They were good teachers, and we had everything we needed. We had music, art, um, math, all of those, you know, everything that, that you're supposed to have in a, a, a school we had in our schools. Will you tell me the names of all the people in your family, your, your parents and your brothers and sisters? My mother's name was Rosa Lenora Gardner Abbott. She was actually given a name for an aunt who delivered her. She didn't ever tell us that. I found it out in history. And, and um, my father's name was George Nathan Abbott. And um, he was a pretty gentle, hard worker. Mother was a very hard worker and the type of a person, if anyone was sick in the neighborhood, she was when they would call for help, and she seemed to know how to take care of things. If anyone needed their house cleaned real specially, like the wife had died and the husband needed help getting things in order, they'd call mother because they knew she knew how to handle it with her large family. Um, they were both very hard workers. And they were both strict. The gospel was very important in our family. And uh, they were both very strict. And they loved their families. <laughs> they loved us, but they loved the families they came from. And, uh, and, and your brothers and sisters, would you mind just letting me know a little, little bit about them? It's interesting because uh, I, that's exactly what they asked me when I went to the, to the where did I go yesterday? Family search. <laughs> to the family search. And they wanted me to tell them about my brothers and sisters. My oldest brother's name was Brent. He was gentle. He was strict with the children. When he had to be strict with us, he was strict with us. He was, uh, he and Hermes were in the same grade because Hermes skipped a grade. She, she skipped that, that first grade. And uh, so they always went to school together, all through school and even Dixie College. And then um, they were always friends. <clears throat> Brent was, uh, he, he was strict himself about everything. My, my father was a custodian of schools. He had three schools that he was custodian of, and uh, so he needed a lot of help. And, uh, of course, Brent, being the oldest in the family, uh, had to help a lot. Brent played the violin. Well, and he was a singer. He had a wonderful voice um, as a child, even. And then as he grew up, and when I was, uh, went 
to Reno. That's where I went to work. And uh, there was a group of men who had a wonderful chorus there, and they chose him to come with them. And he sang with them, I guess, for the rest of his life. What we said, nearly everyone in, in Reno area had someone in their family whose funeral he sang at or whose wedding he sang at. He, he was a very good singer. And um, he, they had four children. And um, he, he and his wife were very compatible. They did a lot of traveling. He, he sold insurance also. And so did a lot of traveling around the world. <laughs> wow. So after Brent, then came Hermes, is that right? Or and then Hermes was a wonderful pianist and organist. And uh, she's she kind of like her second mother. She just uh, picked up all the little pieces that needed to be taken care of. And when mother was busy or mother was gone, she was just like her mother. She and I were always very, very close. Um, when I first got the pain in my leg, my parents had gone to the funeral to the temple that day, and I had gone to the school, and I went down the slide and bumped my leg, and that's when it started hurting. I walked home, and she, she was strict, and she says, "How come you're so late, Mary? You were supposed to sit the table, remember?" Well, I started to cry and say yes, but I hurt, and I really do hurt. And she said, okay, then go on and get on the bed, and we won't worry about it. She was very particular in everything, in her looks, in her housework, in her cooking, and in her schoolwork. She was very uh, top. Excellent. And who came after that in the family? Um, Wesley, but he just lived six weeks. He died of pneumonia. Wow. And then after Wesley? And then mother had twins, Max and Maxine. And she uh, had, followed, uh, had felt so terrible when she lost Wesley. And uh, she said, well, it's just Heavenly Father's way of repaying me for losing Wesley. And uh, Max and Maxine were darling kids. Everyone in town, when they were around, they'd say, sing for us, and they would. They'd sing songs, and, and they uh, did a lot of things together. Maxine was a little more outgoing than Max, but um, Max was pretty smart in school, but kind of shy. And... Uh, they really were close together all their all their lives, and um, of course, being in the same grade, and they went to Dixie School. Well, she went to Dixie College, was scholar on scholarship, and Max went to Reno State on on scholarship. And uh, even after they married and things, they um, they enjoyed each other's company. That's wonderful. Excellent. We're working our way through. So who came next after Max and Maxine? Keith. Keith was our only one born in St. George. Keith was a small baby. <clears throat> he, he was a year older than, two years older than I, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't know him until I was a little bit older, but he, he was cute. He was fun. He liked to joke. He also liked to throw a little tizzy fit if, if it happened to come his way. But uh, the people, the, his friends liked him, both the girls and boys. I had lots of girlfriends because uh, of Keith. <laughs> because they wanted to, to be around him more. And uh, he, he, was, he was cute. He was, he was good. He was smart. He, he didn't like bees. If a bee came, he could run fast. 
because bees would s seem to find him and sting him and cause problems. But uh, he liked little animals. He raised, raised little uh, lambs that were strays from the lambs that came through town. He liked birds. He was a Boy Scout, and he liked rabbits and had built his own rabbit hutches and had the rabbits, and it froze one night and killed all the rabbits, and it was a real funeral. He, he had that sensitive touch about him. And, uh, of course, I liked him a lot because he was close to me, and he was two years ahead in school, but that wasn't very much where we grew up. So did you come next after Keith? I or? came after Keith. Excellent. And, and then anyone after you? Myron. Okay. And the Myron was very shy. He was a quiet fellow. But he also was the type of a person, we had to get our water out of a well. And if we were eating dinner or something and needed water, and someone would say, Max, will you get it? Will you get us some water? No, Keith will. He he like he likes to get the water out of the tank. Keith said, "It's not my turn, but Myron will do it, won't you, Myron?" Yes, Myron will do it. He was the type that would, tried to tried to please everyone. Yeah, excellent. Anybody come after Myron? Royal. Royal. Okay. Royal was cute. He was, he was born um, with naturally curly hair, and he was blonde and, and, and really cute, and Mama loved it. Daddy made her cut it because he was a boy. And uh, he, he you know, it was a little hard with him being between me and Myron. Um, he, he had a harder time with his disposition, I think, than most any of the children. And um, he was he was good. And I was really close with Myron all my life because uh, they needed a sister to kind of, those boys needed a sister to kind of direct them, you know. Right. And Myron, he was always eager to talk to me and listen mean, to me. You and, mean Royal? I mean... Royal? Oh, Myron. Royal was a little bit more like he wanted a kitty car that my folks had bought me because this was the leg I had to be careful with and couldn't push it, and I could push the kitty car, see? But no one else was supposed to touch it. No one else was supposed to use it or do anything because it was for me. Well, Royal wanted it. He really wanted it. And I said, you can't have it, Royal, because the folks said you can't have it. It was supposed to be for me. He got angry, went over and broke a branch off the tree and came and took the branch and hit my leg <laughs> as hard as he could. He had a little bit of that. A little temper. A little bit of temper, and yet... His school teacher, he was um, a good student, even in the elementary school, and they said the only problem was they couldn't keep him busy because he was so smart. He'd finish up, you know, and they'd have to find extra jobs for him to do. And um, um, he was he, he was clever with... Um, he, he liked to take things apart. Like he took Mother's ring apart that her brother had given to her. She wouldn't marry a certain man. <laughs> and uh, he'd come home, and if, he, if Mother had been baking, he wouldn't stop for anything. He'd go right where he knew those cookies were or something. I, and he liked to make candy. In a way, he was shy, and in a way, he was... A little maybe too outgoing, but he had a wonderful singing voice. He just was too shy to perform. And uh, but he and I got along all right. I mean that was that was a hard thing. 
uh, when he hit my leg, and but he did never do it again. And uh, he, he quite often would come and talk to me about things he liked to do at school and things he didn't like at school and kids he liked to be around and so forth. Um, I think that was easier than talking to an older brother or a younger brother. Yeah. And, and did anyone come after Royal? David Owen. Okay. And tell me about David. David got pneumonia when he was just about five weeks old and died. Wow. Must have been difficult for your parents to have lost. Oh, it was hard. It was hard on all of us. We all were so uh, crazy about that little baby. And uh, Keith, uh, Keith was very fond of him, and he'd go to the little cradle and look at him, and and uh, he kept saying he wanted to touch him, he wanted to kiss him, and and everyone would you know try to talk him out of it, but he. That's one thing he wanted to do. And so I think my father lifted him up once and yeah. let him kiss him. And he just had the strangest look on his face. There was no baby there. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. there was no life there. And, and that was hard for him yeah. to uh, take. Wow. And then any others after that? In your Richard. Oh, Richard. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, and then because Richard came after David Owen died, then uh, we were all excited about that. Daddy had pneumonia. Hermes had pneumonia. It was right close to Christmas time, and uh, it was a hard time having the baby and keeping him keeping healthy him and so forth. And he was a cute little baby, and... Uh, uh, I remember uh, he died on a Sunday. Um, my Uncle Dave, who lived in Mesquite, but it was they were just like our family, all of us together. And Uncle Dave came to the church and called me out and told me that, da that David Owen, they, they called him David Owen, had just died. And... Um, that was a hard, it was a hard time. And because everyone in town had pneumonia, they, hold the, they held a funeral in our home. We had uh, um, two big rooms together divided by a fireplace. And so there was plenty of room for the people to, uh, to, to come to the little funeral there at our, our home. And... Uh, I remember the song they sang, one song was, Your Sweet Little Rosebud Has Left You. <laughs> and, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't um, Steve, Stephen, who had left, it was David Owen. So then when David came. Richard? Richard. Uh, Richard. Too many, I can't remember all their names. <laughs> when Richard came, it was an extra happy time. And Richard was a healthy, well, he wasn't really healthy at first, but he, he, he got over it and, and was healthy and a happy, very happy little boy. And um, Hermes would play the piano and Richard would sit up on the piano stool and sing all the songs that she would play. And, and he was smart all through school. All through school, and uh, good, and had lots of friends, but wasn't overbearing or anything. And then he, uh, when we went to Nampa, he was in el elementary school. And uh, one day the teachers were talking about the students and in in the schoolroom, and I guess kind of giving a little compliment to different ones, you know, and and they, uh, when it came to to um, Richard, and they talked about a little boy who was so smart and so bright, they said, and he was, 
And through high school, I think he went to college on scholarship, and that he went to college in um, in Mesa. Tucson. Tucson, Tucson. in Tucson. And uh, and he was. He was, I just always felt, I don't have to worry about Richard because he'll always be okay. That's excellent. So have we covered all the siblings now? Anybody after Richard? Or is that the last of your siblings? He was the last of the siblings. Perfect. Now I just want to say, if there's any time during this interview that you want to take a break or get a drink of water, just let me let me know and we can do that. Okay. But, so when you were talking about Myron, you mentioned getting water out of a well. I just wonder, how, how were things different back then when you well, were Well, there was no, I mean, the running water that came in through town for uh, uh, irrigation and things was red. I mean, it came from the Red Hills. And the, the, you had to uh, put it out to keep it outside in barrels to tried to keep the uh, scum off from it and keep it clean. But what they did, of course, uh, to take care of it, was to build big wells in the backyard and cement them in very deep, and then you put a pump on them. I wrote you put a rope on a bucket and drop the bucket in and pulled it up with the rope, yeah. one or the other. And... Uh, Never did taste that good, but uh, the folks somewhere or other, they knew how to put something in it to make it taste better. I mentioned that the, that's only one of probably lots of different changes that you've seen during your lifetime, that things were different when you were little compared to the way they are now. Anything else that comes to mind that, that would have been different? Well, I, ha I had a chance to go to college with scholarship. And, and uh, it had always been my dream was to go to college, and I was a good student in school. And uh, then just at that time, we moved to Nampa. And so um, they told me in Bunkerville if I would just stay there, and in fact, the principal was next living next door to us, and he and his wife said, Live with us, Mary, just so you can finish high school here and, and um, you can get a scholarship. And um, But I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't send the boys with the folks. I didn't, I didn't want the boys to go and be the only ones there. I wanted to be there to, to listen to them and kind of help them too, you know. And they wanted me to, and so um, I went with them. And when Mother went back, when my sister had a baby, the principal said, and this was in March of that year of graduation, and the principal said, if you'll let Mary come back, she can have her choice of scholarships. And of course we had Reno, Logan, St. George. Well, I couldn't leave my folks. They were getting older. They had those boys to raise. They worked hard. I couldn't do it. So I didn't. So I stayed there. Went to beauty college. <laughs> in Nampa? In or... Nampa. They came over. I was working at the, in the drugstore, and the girls from the college kept coming and coaxed me to come over and they were going to start a new class. Well, I didn't have the kind of money that you needed to pay tuitions and things with. But Maxine was living with us then because Norman was in France. And she had a, a little year-old baby and she came home to live with us. So that was, that was really fun to have her with us. And finally she said, Mary... If you will go to beauty college, I will pay your tuition, and then we'll figure another way out to help pay the other fees. Well, when I went over, the, the boss wanted me to come and talk to them to start with, you know. 
And when I went over and talked to her, I, t I told her, I said, we just don't have the money. I just can't do it. And um, she said, how would you like to wash towels? She said, we do all of our own towels in the basement. How would you like to do that? I said, well, I know how to wash towels <laughs> and take care of them. And so that's the way it worked. And then um, after I got through my hours, uh, the little girl who was teaching the book work wanted to leave because she wanted to go to her hometown to start a beauty shop there. And so they asked me if I would, uh, if I would come and teach the class, and then I got paid for that. I didn't still have to do the towels. <laughs> I didn't mind. I really didn't mind. I'm making it sound hard. We had lots of towels, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed the class. I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed working with the girls there. And it became a way for you to actually do it, right? It and... Uh, so then I taught for two years. What? So it was a, it was it paid off and and it was it sounds like a, I'm pleading a hardship. I wasn't. I I just felt like I was lucky to be able to to walk into the things I walked into. Yeah, that's excellent. What year did you graduate from high school? Oh, what time did I graduate? <laughs> Mom, do you know what year Grandma graduated from high school? She was born in 26, so it probably would have been 34. 1934? Uh -huh. 1934? Uh-huh. 26. She was born 26, so 40, 44? So, oh, yeah, it would have been 18 years. Well, you got married in 45. She got married in 45, so, so it would have been more like 42 or 43. Okay. Uh -huh. So, World War I, I mean, World War II would have been going on. All the time. Well, I remember so well when World War II broke out. What was your personal experience with it? Um, it, it broke out on a Sunday, uh, and uh, they were having a big uh, air show in Las Vegas because they had that big, beautiful new air base there. And so the folks went to church in the morning, and then they went down there for that, because my sister and her husband lived there in Las Vegas. They went down for the air show. Well, while, while we kids were walking the streets in the afternoon after church, someone got it on the, on the radio, and uh, we were frightened. It was very frightening. But there were a lot, of, a lot of things that brought us all together, not just Bunkerville, but the United States. Music. Um, caring about the military people. It was, it was a wonderful time. We had a close feeling, not about the war, but it did bring us together. When the person got on the radio, was it announcing Pearl Harbor? or was It, it was announcing Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And what was your, will you describe that experience as well as you can remember that? Scared to death. I had, I had brothers in the military. <laughs> scared me, scared us to death. And later on, when you were in in Nampa, you said Norman was in France. Was he in France because of the war? Is he was in France with a big, that great big, yeah. He was the, the great big fight that was over there. We read about it all the time. Normandy. Yeah. The Normandy. Normandy. Uh huh. And um, he got back without getting hurt, but he was right in the thick of it. And you can you you can understand if if there is no mail being transported one way or the other, if you got a letter, it was either so much of it was clicked out that you couldn't tell what they were trying to say anyway, but you didn't get many letters. Uh, there just wasn't that much. We we saw quite a bit on the on the television though. They did. They did show us a lot on the television and the radio. 
Um, it was um, it was hard when Maxine lived with us, and believe you me, I wasn't anxious to get married. <laughs> I wasn't anxious to see anything like that because I saw how hard it was for her and for our friends, our friend, girlfriends. We had a real close ward in Nampa. It was wonderful for young people, uh, those who were still at home, you know, and uh, we had great leaders. But it gives us, gave us a new idea about life that we had never experienced. What was it precisely that took your mom and dad from Bunkerville to Nampa? Um, well, this area, Hillfield is going in. And all these men, all these farmers had nice fields up here. And the government wanted it to put Hillfield there. And so those who were farmers and wanted to, were kind of wanting to move anyway, got a very high price for their farms and moved up into that area. And a lot of our friends were these great farmers and they just kept coaxing my father to go. We didn't have the money they had. We didn't have the equipment they had. But my uncle was moving up there and he said, we'll share it, Nate. We'll just share it together. And uh, so, we moved, and, and, be, and it was kind of a happy move, kind of fun, you know, to be there with so many of our friends from Virgin Valley. And, uh, but uh, it was very hard on my parents. And yeah, they liked it. So that's what took us there. That's what took me, took me there. That's what introduced me to my husband. <laughs> Should we talk about you meeting Grandpa Johnson? <laughs> you probably don't want to know. <laughs> so he, he came home on furlough. He had been overseas for uh, two years. He'd been overseas for two years. And um, he came home on leave. And his family was wanting him to meet someone. You know, he was getting... He was gaining on years, and and uh, so he had a sister my age, and we had ridden bus together to school. And uh, one day she had showed me his picture that he had, she had just received from him, and I looked at it, and he was dressed in uniform. He looked nice and everything, but he was just he was just a military man, you know. We saw them all the time. <laughs> And I wasn't, like I said, I, I, I wasn't very anxious about getting married. I knew what a struggle it was for the, my friends. And anyway, he had different ideas, and he kind of kept coming, <laughs> kind of kept coming back until I went out with him. And then just going with him once, just being in the car with him and talking about his life and my life and our families. And he loved his family. He loved his mother so much. And he, he loved the whole family, but he truly loved his mother. And, um, and he, he only had one brother, and he was Richard's age, a lot younger than, than True was. And... Uh, so he was very close to his sisters, too. And so we dated and uh, went to the movie. And and he, I, I realized what a nice guy he was, how good he really was. Yes, he smoked. <laughs> I didn't like that. I, I just vowed I would never go with him again. But he had a brand new car when he could come home from the military and buy a brand new car and other people couldn't even buy an old one, you know, <laughs> that helped a little bit. <laughs> <It's kind of> <laughs> and he, he was always there if I needed him. I mean, I didn't have to tell him I needed a ride home or I needed this or that. He just, when he was able to be there, he was there waiting for me. And uh, we- Do you recall the first time you met him? 
the first time I met him, I said no. Oh, that was interesting, too. He wanted to come pick me up from work because I worked the late shift. And I said, no, my father's coming to pick me up. And he said, I'll come right by their house and I'll tell them I'm coming. I said, that would not be a very good thing for you to do. <laughs> and I won't do that. And um, he said, well, could I? That was on Saturday. And he said, can I come and see you tomorrow? And I said, yes. If you'd like to come down and see me, because they only lived a couple of miles from me. And um, I had invited six girls to my house for dinner that day after church. And I thought, this will, this will heal it. He came, and instead of being dressed in his suit and his cl dress clothes, he was in his coverall type uniform, you know. And um, he was clean and neat and nice and looked looked nice, but I thought, oh, he's he's not very he's not trying to impress me dressing like that, and and this will stop it all when we go in the house. And we went in, and he went over and sat down on the piano stool and started goofing around and started joking. And those girls all knew him; they'd grown up with him, and they were so tickled to see him. They were so happy to see him, and he, and you know he's such a clown anyway when he wants to be, and laugh and talk and and you could tell how happy the girls were. And I thought this is not the fellow that people told me was kind of wild. It's not the same fellow. Anyway, um, he said, "Can I take you home?" I said, "You can come pick me up after choir." I, I led the choir, the young people's choir in church, and we started, and I didn't get through till 9 o'clock at night on Sundays. And so I said, do you want to come and pick me up? Uh, you can bring me home that night. When I came out of the choir, when you were out there, here he was out there having the wonderful talk with all the men, all, all the men he grew, you know, in the church. They were out there waiting to take the children home. They were happy to see True. They hadn't seen him yet. And, they, and I thought, this is a different person than I've, than my friends had said he was. And um, so I anyway, knew we just started going together. And What had your friends told you? It sounds like you were operating on a certain assumption of the kind of guy he was. What, where did you get that impression? Well, because he smoked. Didn't he bring? What? Didn't he bring Don and Dale into? Oh, that? Wasn't oh, that the first time. That first, time first time, the first, he brought his little nephews, Donald and Dale, and they were just little children, um, probably five and seven or eight. Brought them into the drugstore where I worked, and I wasn't up on the counter at that time. I was doing some things in the basement, making making their pies for them. And, uh, but I did happen to go up, you know, to take some pies up, so I saw him there, and and I, I wasn't impressed. I mean, he had another military fellow. and he buy him a Coke? And he, and he, when I was up there, he bought them Cokes. I thought, what a stupid guy, bringing his little nephews here and buying them Cokes. And, uh, yeah, that, that was my first... Uh, wondering exactly what he was made of, <laughs> but uh, you had heard of him before then, because which of well, the sisters had uh, because all my friends had grown up with him there in the church, you know. Were you good friends with Joanne. Oh yeah, his, his sister. I mean, you were good friends with his sister, weren't you? Oh yes, I was good friends with her. We weren't real, real close, but we were good friends. We rode the school bus together. We talked, you know, and everything. But I just was not in the mood to be looking for a friend. Well, I was, I had other boys that were, I was dating anyway, you know. And uh, you go to the dances, you have to have a date, you go. And so I wasn't, I just wasn't that interested until I got to know him. I had to know him really well. But that first night, we, I, anyway, 
he was just there for a little while, and then he had to go back back east to get re-upped in his career and everything. And uh, I th- I thought, oh, this will this will take care of it. He'll be gone. He won't be out here. I won't have to worry. And uh, he even wrote me a letter. I couldn't believe. I thought, oh, what's he writing me a letter for? And um, then one day the telephone rang at the beauty shop, and then someone told me it was for me, and I went, and it was true. And he said he was there in Nampa, and he wondered if he could come and see me or take me home or something or if we could do something. Well, I couldn't lie. And I said, oh, I guess so, yeah. Certain time, I said, I do have to work a little bit late tonight, and that doesn't matter, he said. And um, then he pulled strings enough to get stationed there at Gallon Field. And he could because he'd been in the military long enough, you know, and all of that. And so it just happened. What was it? How many months did I go with him? Sixteen, something like that. We went together for a long time. More than a year, it sounds like. How many times were you engaged? <laughs> Just three times. <laughs> <laughs> to the same man. With Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> the last time. <laughs> he said, we were talking, and I said, he said, Bill, you want to say, try the ring again? And I said, oh, I guess so, yeah, I guess so. And he said, now remember, you're just trying the ring again. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't take it off after that. <laughs> I don't know how he put up with me. But we were a good couple. <laughs> and, our, and our friends, my friends were excited. After all the things they had said about him when he was gone overseas, and, and of course they'd known him when he was a senior in high school and a junior in high school, and they were, Joanne, they were a lot, a lot younger because he's five years older than I am. And uh, so um, everyone got to know him. <laughs> it sounds like everybody else approved. They thought it was a good match. They did. It sounds like he's the kind of guy who didn't give up. He didn't give up. <laughs> he, d- he didn't give up. I was just reading. I was just reading um, in my journal something that I had r- written. Did, did I write it or did Keith? Anyway, we were writing it, and he had interviewed each of the girls about how they felt like us getting married and so forth. and I'm used to the boys, I mean. And each one of them said, oh, we like you a lot, but we think Mary's better for, better than you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't think you're good enough for her. That type of thing, you know. That didn't stop him either. He was there and knew us, knew me pretty well, knew the whole family pretty well. <laughs> But, he, you know, he's he's just a, not a pretender, wasn't pretending anything, wasn't pretending it was going to change anything. <laughs> and so, so we, well, he was going to college, and, and we had decided that if, when he came home at, at Easter time, if we still had the same feelings that we would set a marriage date. Well, in the meantime, the war ended, and we had said we would not get married as long as the war was on. And uh, so he had come from college, brought me a ring and some beautiful flowers, and... Um, Anyway, went right from there. (laughs) 
So when and where did you get married? Where did we get married? Yeah, and when? On the 20th of December. We had set the date for the 19th because he would have been home a couple of days. And, and uh, something happened. That he couldn't get home until... And so we changed it to the 20th, and we got married in my mother's living, my mother's and father's living room. Wasn't a fancy house. My sister, Maxine, and her, her husband got home to come to my wedding, and my brother Max and his wife, he, he was in the military, and he was in Texas, and he... Both those couples got home to be there for my wedding. I mean, it was just a miraculous thing, and they and they got everything fixed up really nice. And the man who married us was my bishop when I first went to Nampa, and then he became our state president. So he had interviewed me several times about several, you know, just. How bishops interview you, but he 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 married me. I mean, he he's the one who interviewed me, and one of my good friends, who played the piano so beautifully and sang so beautifully. Um, she was older, but we were really good friends and worked in the music department together, and she played the piano for it. And then she sang a solo for it, a special solo. And um, Mother made her famous fruitcake. The little boys stood at the chair. <laughs> what did you wear? What? What did you wear? What, were you, what clothes did you wear during your wedding? Oh, we couldn't buy any clothes. Mother and I went to you know, St. George, every place. Couldn't buy any wedding clothes. Couldn't even buy fabric for it. Mother could have made the dress. Uh, and I finally found, and it's a black, a black dress with white dots in it. You You've a, seen it. I thought it was more of a bluish gray color. It was. Yeah. It was, a yeah. Bluish gray color. It was. And it fit perfectly. And we were running out of time, and we only had so much money. Anyway, I I had been saving my money in case we did get married, so that I have money to buy clothes and things with, and uh, and this dress fit really well and looked nice. And I said, "Well, no, it's it's not white, white temple dress, but I couldn't wear a white temple dress. I mean, I." Would, wasn't worrying about that at that time. I knew I couldn't yeah. anyway. And um, then I had saved enough money to get me a nice purse, a nice hat, a nice suit for going away. <laughs> and we've had a happy, happy marriage. Just out of curiosity, why couldn't you find a wedding dress or wedding fabric or white fabric? Couldn't find. They didn't have fabrics. Just wasn't available at the time? No. They just, um, every, the war had wiped everything out. Oh, yeah. And um, anyway. So you just had to make do with a, a, a gray blue polka dot <laughs> dress? It, it, it wasn't, it, it was kind of a darkish gray, wasn't it? It was a, a pretty color. Yeah. Pretty color. And, um, I wore it for several years <laughs> for my best dress. <laughs> and, you, and we were going right up to, back up to college. Okay. Did you go on any kind of honeymoon or wedding trip, or was it just straight back to college? What, what, what came next? Um, well, we didn't have money to go on a trip. I mean, I, I had enough money to get some of those nice clothes and things, but... Um, True had to get back into school, and uh, so we finished that semester. <laughs> yeah, I guess this is the funny part of it. We finished the semester, and saved 
he he worked. And of course, he got some money from the government. They gave him some money, and I worked at the beauty shop. I I had I had a job before I even got up there at the beauty shop, and uh, we lived right in, in the back part of the beauty shop in a little room which she rented, and so we had saved enough money to take a nice trip, and so. Um, he worked, then the next summer, he came down and worked in the pea, pea vines to make more money. And um, we had enough money, and we decided we'd go to Reno. And uh, went through Las Vegas and Nevada and out to Reno to my brothers and uh, had a wonderful trip. But just before... <laughs> just before we got ready to go. <laughs> Mother said, oh, I wish I were going with you. <laughs> Drew said, get your suitcase rolls, put your clothes in, you're going with us. <laughs> so did she come? Yes. <laughs> she came and... Uh, she had a... That's all right. Fun family trip. <laughs> it was a family trip. <laughs> That's excellent. True liked her. She liked True anyway because she could joke with him. Mother was a hard worker and all of that, but she also was a joker. And she, I had been going with True long enough. He'd been around long enough that they had these jokes going back and forth, you know. And I anyway, I looked at her kind of strange, and she went in and packed her clothes and went with us. <laughs> well, she could stop in in Las Vegas with Hermes and her husband and Maxine and her husband. She'd get to see them. She had Uncle Jax and his wife lived in Cedar City, and we could stop and see them. And uh, then we went through uh, Las Vegas. Anyway, we did. We had it. We had a fun trip. <laughs> just as a little um, side sidestepping here for just a little bit, just for the sake of younger people. Nowadays, if you're going to make that trip, you'll just get on I-15 and go all the way down. But what was a long trip like that like back then? Well, we stayed with. Let's see. Oh, I I, th I think we had uh, ten days. Ten days was our trip. We stayed with Brent and Norma, saw all of Reno. We you know we saw things we hadn't seen before. Did things that were fun, and all of my family were. None of them really thought true was good enough for me. <laughs> he was probably so much better than I. But anyway. But they liked him. The kids all liked him. Whenever we'd go to see them, they were really, really excited when Truth came to see them. Yeah. Sounds like he had a, an award-winning personality. He did, didn't he, kids? Yeah. <laughs> so just give me a really quick, broad stroke of, of what the next 20 years are going to look like. Well, um, we enjoyed it in Corvallis. We really enjoyed it, and um, one of True's friends, they had they had gone together and lived in a professor's and his wife's basement the year before, so they knew each other well, and he loved to come to our house for dinner, <laughs> his friend did. And they, and they had a lot to talk about because they'd been in different, different groups in the military, and, and so they had a lot to talk about, even though they had been together already. And um, and then uh, she got married in December. I got pregnant in June. I got pregnant in June. And we were both excited. <laughs> I was really excited, and True was really excited. And... Um, 
that all went well, except that Trudy had a club foot when she was born. But he's, uh, I was the one who discovered it. And the doctor said, I don't think it is, Mary. But he, when he looked at it, he said, there is a little club foot there. But that's no problem and explained how they could treat it, you know, and everything. And when Truth thought, instead of carrying on, he just said, well, at least she doesn't have a, oh, some kind of a funny thing about her chest. <laughs> he, he said, this, that won't be anything to her. But it was expensive, but we got it taken care of. And, and uh, her children didn't even know for years that she'd, that she'd had that club foot. I mean, it, it was just a blessing all the way around. The Lord has blessed us so, so many ways. And uh, we've been very fortunate, where very did you fortunate. Live, where did you live when Trini was born? In Corvallis. What took you there? Is that, is that where you were uh, going to school? True was going to school there, and I was working at the beauty shop. Mm-hmm. He went back in the military, and, and I went, because the, the Korean War broke out, he was out of the military, but... Uh, Decided he'd get in where where he could at the time because he knew he'd get called back, and then um, he went back in the military, was sent to um, the island. Um, Guam or Island? What? No, didn't he go to Alaska? Not yet. As- oh. Was it Ascension Island or Guam? It was. It was uh, out in the. Yeah. It was it's a wonderful place to, for him to go, and I went home with Trudy, and that's her. And then, and then he went, Then he was sent to Alaska, Teresa, and was in Alaska when you were born. And you were in Nampa. And I, and I was in Nampa. <clears throat> and then we went to Tucson. And then we went to um, Spokane. Spokane. And then we went to Houston, Texas. Jake. It's okay. It's not that big of a deal. And then... Or Fair Oaks. Fair Oaks, California. Two places in California. Fair Oaks first and then... Roswell. 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 We, We were in Roswell five years. Wonderful place for us to be. And then from Roswell, where did you go after that? Atwater. 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 California. Oh, yeah. from from Ros from Atwater. Yeah. Oh yes. Roswell to Atwater. Roswell and Atwater, and then to Farmington. Okay. Oh well, to Clearfield. Air Force, yeah. Yeah. Clearfield yeah. for a year, because he was. He still had a year to serve in the military. And then we went to Farmington, Farmington for five years. Uh, no. Oh, 10 years, didn't we? 30. About 10 30. years. <laughs> 30. 30. <laughs> what? 30. 30 years. Oh, sure. 38 years. <laughs> 38, years. <laughs> 38 years in Farmington. Yeah. All and, right. And, and then to St. George. And Stop. now I have this wonderful home in <laughs> Late, late in Utah. <laughs> well, you're quite a traveled person now after all those moves. My girls say, t- oh, well, t- the moves have included, Trudy was a, what did you do? <laughs> Janice was a travel agent. A travel agent. And every once in a while she'd take me with her on one of the travels like to the islands and things. Right. So I got to do that. And then uh, um, I, went, I went to college. My aunt sent me, uh, my aunt died. I was named after my Aunt Mary. And she had died and left me some money. And uh, I said to True, you know, I don't know what to do with this money. What shall we do with it? That's something for Aunt Mary to work all these years and then give all of us some money. And uh, 
He said, do whatever you want with it or whatever you think she'd like you to do. I had wanted to go to college always. And I wrote, I didn't figure I could go because I'd been out of high school for so long. I went over and talked to them at the college and they said, send back to your last place of school and, and see what they say. It came through, no question in nothing. And so I was accepted right there, and I went to school in Weber, at Weber, and I graduated from Weber. And then I went up to the University of Utah and didn't quite make it to get through there. I mean, it's a long story. I won't do that. But Trudy was born in Corvallis. Oh, we adored her, and every place she went, they just made the biggest fuss over her. She was, she was smart, and she was beautiful, and we were living with my folks, and they adored her, so she got a good start there. Even with a club foot, she, we were at the doctor a lot, but that got taken care of, and and uh, then uh, then we went to Nampa. As true went back in the military, he, he had he he got out when when the war was over. Right. But then when the Korean War came up, they knew they had to get back. That he would be called back, so he just went back and got back in where he was when he left. And um, was it difficult for you to be a mom with my mom being born? while Grandpa was off in Alaska? What was hard with your mother being born is she decided, you know, when she decides she wants to do something, even now, she finds a way to do it. And as a baby, she, her water's broke in the night, all night long, soaked my, soaked my mattress. I got up and turned the mattress over, washed my hair. Mother called the doctor. We got in the car and barely got to the hospital. I didn't even get on the table before they were saying, hurry, 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 hurry. And after she was born, the doctor came in and was just slapping my face like this, and he said, Mary, don't ever pull a trick like that on me again, will you? <laughs> she just, and she was a smiley baby. She did. Every place I'd go with her, people would say, oh, look at that smile on that face. She was, and she and Trudy got along really well. As little babies, you know, they could play together in the in the crib and, and have fun and go out on the lawns and and they just were good little girls together. And then before long, Uncle Jim came along? And Jim, True was so excited. I, I can still see that look on his face when he looked and saw that it was a boy. He was, he, he left one week after Jim was born, he was sent to Guam for three months. But he loved that little boy, and he was so happy for him. And then um, Janice, and she was so cute. <laughs> she, she was our little firecracker. She was born on the 4th of July, you know. And um, then... Um, where did we go after that, girls? We in Spokane when I was born. In Spokane and Wrong. any uh, anyway, but uh, these these children, of course, you all will always have times when you get upset at, at things that go on. I got I got upset in um, Portland. Oh, I didn't say we lived in Portland. I got upset when we lived there because True was overseas. Robert was a baby. I didn't say Robert. 
And uh, you mean Spokane? And yeah. when oh. and in the night, the house we lived up on a little up on a hill and a level hill, you know. And then there was a deep on the one side of us. There was a deep uh, housing area down here. And that night, that housing area burned down. And it really, uh, I was really frightened at that time because of that. I had this tiny Robert <laughs> and the other children and was up with, you know, up in the house, up above the house that was burning. But it didn't... It didn't bother us at all after it finally settled down a little bit. I imagine that was kind of nerve-wracking. But it was very nerve-wracking. Do you, do you recall the circumstances when Rob was born? I know these are all details. I can't remember all the circumstances. Actually, I, I guess I could, but it's, it yes. takes a little bit of time to think about it. Yes. Uh, my neighbor, and True, is gone, and so the neighbors were waiting for me to give them the word to take him to the hospital. And um, so uh, I was waiting, and uh, finally we went, and the nurse checked me, and she said, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to wait an hour before we get this baby here, and then it won't cost you as much. It was in a city hospital. We waited, we waited the next morning. All night they were checking me. I think I had about 30 people checking me during the night and the next morning. And it and he wasn't born till, the, till that next night. But uh, he was born healthy and sound and good. And I, we never did find a reason it took so long for him to get there. Probably me. I probably was a little bit too tight. I probably was nervous. And um, and then when David was born, we forgot Steve. Better better put in Steve before we put in David. Do you recall the circumstances I'm, for Steve? I'm trying to think about Steve. Yes, we lived in Spokane, and. Uh, <clears throat> In Spokane, is a pretty nice climate in the summer, but this summer it happened to be quite warm. We had a nice basement, to, and I was in there, and the girls fed me ice chips all the time. I just, oh, I just couldn't get enough. I just couldn't get cool enough. And um, then he just didn't come. Each night I'd, I'd feel like I was going to go, and uh, I didn't, and my neighbors would say, if you'd leave that broom, if you'd put that broom down, Mary, you'd have that baby. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, finally went to the, the hospital I had uh, gone to with Robert. Uh, the doctor was not the same when I, w I, st I went to the base hospital when I got Steve. They had a, a new hospital there. And uh, so it was about 20 miles from home. And sure enough, True was gone, and I drove Janice to the hospital. Actually, For, Dad was there when Steve was born. Dad was there because he made me a birthday cake, remember? Yeah, Dad, he got back. Oh, yeah, he, okay. he got back and was, was there. I was there quite a while that day waiting. <laughs> and uh, True got there. I don't know. I had a hard time. I had a hard time. I went to the hospital twice thinking I, and they thought I was in labor, and they had to send me home twice. And finally I said, Steve, I've just got to have a blessing. Uh, I just hurt too bad, too much. And um, he said, we had a, a patriarch in our ward that we just really adored. And, he said, I'll talk to him, and so he did. And we went over there, and he wondered, he said, 
why didn't you give her the blessing? True, and he said, she needed, she needed someone else to give it to her. And um, then, um, I still have to wait, I had to wait about half a day before I went into labor and, and went there. And then I went out to the hospital and then called True and said, I'm at the hospital and they think I'm going to go in to have this baby tonight. And so he got everything packed and everything ready and took care of the kids. And did he get someone to come and stay with you? Sure but anyway, I went to the hospital and went up and he got to come up and be with me when I was in labor. And waited there, and when Steve was born, he was so happy. We both were. And uh, there again, just another special spirit. And he was, and all the kids loved him. They really, uh, he, was a, he, was a good, he was a good baby. Uh, when, when we found out we were going to have another baby, we'd waited. Five years? Eight. Eight. Eight, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. And um, the kids had said to me, um, they keep saying, why don't we have another baby? A friend of ours who had babies about the same time I did it had another baby. And they wanted me to say yes. And one day I said to Steve, and he was in kindergarten at the time I said to him, a friend brought her baby over, and I was holding her. And so she, I said, Steve, would you like a little baby like this? And he said, no. <laughs> he was happy. Well, anyway, when when Steve was born, I think everything went well. Dave. Dave. I mean Dave. Dave. Everything went well uh, with David. And it was a brand new hospital, and there were only two of us having babies there that night. And uh, when they finally took me into the room, into the delivery room, uh, they went up. They got newspapers and put all over the the where I was lying on on the delivery bed. And they did, oh, and they brought, they went upstairs and brought, um, what were the newspapers for? The news, well, they, they were just in case I needed them. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you just in a minute. Then, oh, uh, what else? Uh, this other was, oh, the, to give you an, uh, what, if you, had a stroke or something. Anyway, they brought this machine from upstairs down, and uh, and they spread those papers all over under me and around me. And I said, "What are you doing? I've never had anything like this before." They said, "Well, when women near your age, we always have to have an oxygen tent around." And we also have to be sure that the tables are all covered and, and everything's. And afterwards, there were there was there were two fellows and one lady who were doing the the thing. After it, they said, "Why on earth did you put all those papers under me?" Because one of them said, "We can gather the papers up now." He said, "Well." When we were in your age, there are a lot of times we have a lot of problems with um, with the blood and with um, the heart. And that's why we had to have the... <laughs> they didn't need any of it. It's the cleanest delivery we've had. <laughs> so that was, that was good. He was a clean one and... There were two babies there, one little girl and one little boy, and everyone who came in raved about those cute little babies. And uh, and then David was a fun, he was a fun little boy, wasn't he? 
<laughs> he was smart. He liked music from the very beginning. And uh, when he was old enough to sit up and hold the, the big music things, the discs, he'd take the whole set of discs out of the uh, radio, it, wasn't, it was a record player, and put them on his lap here and sit on the floor, put them here, and play one of them at a time until he'd gone through that 12 set of 12. Sometimes he'd started it again. He just loved music. But he also loved the neighbors, and they loved him. And uh, sometimes he'd, when he was running around, when he got a little bit, just a little bit older, he'd run over to the neighbors. And of course, they finally started calling me, but they'd call him to see if he'd come over to their place. David was a very smart boy, and he was and he was kind of spoiled, and he was kind of made a little fuss in school. They wanted to promote him a grade, so I went down and talked to the teachers. I figured they were just trying to get rid of him from one class into the other because he was causing all the problems. And this teacher said. I told them I want him in my class. They put him in my class. He's absolutely no trouble at all. And even when I'd see her later at school thing, something, she'd ask about David, and she'd say, he, he just was so smart and so good. The other kids were always jealous of him. <laughs> so I don't know what that was, but he was good. He was good. Let me just tell you about both of their patriarchal blessings. I don't know whether you've hear, read either one of them or not. Both I, of whose? What? Both of whose? Yours and yours. There's nothing special about mine. There's nothing special well, about you mine. Well, you weren't, it was Trudy. It was Trudy, Trudy and Teresa, Teresa who were there together. It was the, Tr Trudy and Teresa. And, and, we, and they invited me to come in and sit down and listen which I did, and that patriarch had never met the kids. He didn't know us, but he, as he gave their blessings, it was exactly a blessing for, for Trudy's and Trees. They were, they were not the same blessing, but they were the same. Don't you find, do you, do you read yours a lot, Teresa? I read it. I've read it quite a bit since I've been home. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, they were wonderful blessings. These kids were good kids. They were good kids. I was lucky. Music was very important to my life as I was growing up in our home. We always had music in our home. Um, instrumental and singing and and all the kids did something in music there. Um, I loved it. I loved to sing. I had, I, was in, I had the lead in several operas that we did in Bunkerville, in Virgin, Virgin Valley. Loved that. But uh, anyway, it was just a big part of our life, and so we always did something in music in family home evening. Um, we had, you know, the, their missionaries were down there, and True was the branch president, and so they were at our home a lot <laughs> to eat, din eat dinner and things. It was, I think, Christmas time when they're there, and Grandma Johnson was us with us. And we had this big table and ate, and everything was nice. And the missionaries uh, were really nice who were there. There were two boys or four boys. I can't remember whether it was two or four. But anyway, we said, well, come on, let's go sing some songs around the piano. And so we went over and sang several Christmas songs and things. And Janice was just a little girl, five. 
five Janice, or six. <laughs> anyway, she was just little, and Janice was always, she was always kind of quiet, happy but quiet. And this day she said, oh, I can play some, a song for you. And we, good, Janice, come on and play for us. She went over and sat down and played. We think they're God for a prophet. All the way through, without the book. And we all sang, didn't we? <laughs> we were surprised. And so then Robert, always so shy, said, I can play something for you. So he said, well, let's hear you play, Rob. And he sat down and played. But he played it off. <laughs> so <clears throat> we had some fun with songs, and Trudy was at the point where she was doing quite a quite a bit of playing. So she she would play for us, and then she'd change a key right in the middle of the song and expect us to follow her or do something else. Jim acted like he didn't like to sing. He'd go over and lay down on the couch, regardless of what we'd say. He wouldn't. He, I don't know, did he ever sing with us? I'm sure he did sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Maybe we should ask about the, the DUP now. <laughs> I'd love to hear about your experiences with the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers. How did you get involved in that organization? Well, I, w I wondered that sometimes myself. I, I went to DUP all the time. And then um, I w had been up at the Institute of... Uh, oh, Salt Lake. <laughs> and anyway, I, I didn't get my degree there. There was something, something I didn't didn't do right. So I was pretty unhappy, and all my friends who were up there with me were unhappy. But I came back and decided, um, when did I, what did, what did I decide to do then? Anyway, I was still, I, they asked me if I'd be the, the camp captain in DUP. And I had been at once before with this same group of women and enjoyed it. So I thought, oh, I'm not doing anything else. I'll do that. So I did that. And the next thing I know, they voted me in as president of the, of the whole area. The company. The company. <laughs> of the company. And uh, it was a wonderful experience for me. I really had... I worked with some wonderful people. Sometimes you had some people that weren't so easy to work with, but but you enjoyed them all because you needed to. But I, it was a wonderful experience for me to, to be able to do that. Well, so you were like on the board at the national level for several years before you were president. Oh, yes. Um, when I first, when they, they were asking us to come and be docents, you know, and I was the company president, so I thought, I guess I should go at least one day and be a docent. And so I went down and, um, met most of the ladies, and then they asked me if I couldn't come and come at least one day a week, and they gave me a, the sweetest 80-year-old woman to work with. Just <laughs> adored her. She was so sweet and so nice. And sometimes women can be a real nuisance in an organization, and I didn't want any more nuisances. <laughs> I didn't want to get in a crowd like that. But it didn't happen to be. We just had wonderful women 
with enthusiasm. They asked me if I'd run to be president, and I said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go on the board. I, I just don't like to be where women are having problems together, and they seem to be doing pretty well, so I'll come on the board. And I came on the board, and they wanted me to be on the committee to choose the next president. And so we kind of chose one lady who was already on the board and wanted to be the president. But she also was the secretary and didn't want to give up because she got paid to be a secretary. And so he said, you can either run on, run on the board <laughs> or you can stay as the secretary. And the people liked her on, who talked with her on the phone and things. She was a fun lady. And uh, she wouldn't give that, that job up because she wanted the money. Anyway, so the, the guys talked me into letting them put me up for one. And when we had our meeting to vote the presidents in, she got to speak. They had her come up and speak first up in front of all the group. And she is. She was a nice lady. She was a good lady, and she worked hard. But uh, she was getting older, and um, anyway, <clears throat> then I they called me up, and I just gave my little spiel of thanking them and what I liked about DUP and. So they had a group of ladies that had decided that they were going to put this other lady in. So they brought all, all the fun and games and signs and everything and brought them with them, you know, to put in the hall to encourage everyone to vote for their lady they were running. Well, I wasn't, truly, I wasn't. <laughs> I, I hated to run for something and get voted down, but I... Um, wasn't anxious to to be it either, but friends came up to me when they were just starting to count the votes and said, "Mary, you don't need to worry. <laughs> you have all the votes that you need to be." And I didn't know whether to say hurrah or darn it. But anyway, it was a privilege. It really was a privilege for me to, to become the president and work with so many wonderful people. Would you say there's, is there one or two particular accomplishments that you feel satisfied or happy about that you had in the DUP while you were there? Yeah, there were a lot of them. We got the fire engine put together the the old fire engine and a, a, another room put on the building for it. And that was a real um, accomplishment. The, the fire people from um, Centerville volunteered their time. The firemen volunteered their free time to come and work on it. And they they did that. That, that was good. And then we decided we wanted a a statue of a woman put out onto our yard someplace. And so we found this one fellow who was quite the artist, and he was so happy to come and do it for us, did a good job, and put this woman, I don't know if you've ever seen a woman standing on the one, one lawn by the building, and she has a little boy with her, uh, walking, you know, walking along, and I thought that was quite an accomplishment. We, um, the, the biggest thing that people liked, and I mean, we did a lot of things. We rode in the parades and all, and that was kind of fun, too. But the, the biggest thing that uh, we still hear, have people saying, oh, 
That was so much fun in DUP. And Janice was a travel agent. She needed to, she just said to, us, to me once, Mom, I think it, w it would be fun if we got your DUP group, if we invited them to go on trips with us. And how many did we go on, Jan? Ten. Ten trips, and Jan went with us on um, all of them and, you know, oversaw everything. So it was easy for me because I, I knew that it would all be taken care of just perfect. And they loved it, didn't they, Janice? And uh, they tried to do it when the next president went in. And uh, I guess they kind of had fun, but it didn't go over like it did with ours. And we went to ten, 10 different areas overseas for five of them. Six of them. Six of them. And people were still, they were still asking, when are we going to do this again? So um, we did a lot of things. We did, we did, we put a lot of, um, oh, posts up uh, 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 in different areas for, for the oh, trips. The monuments. The, markers, the, monument markers. the monuments. Okay, yeah, yeah. And did a lot of traveling just around. We, we just went to so many places and, and um, had wonderful conventions. And I, it was just a wonderful experience for me to to work with those people. Yeah. Families were always very important to me. My my family that I was raised in, and their children, and then when I got married, True's family became very important to me also. And. Uh, I love I love my children so much. I'm so grateful for them. They are good children. They've been very good children. I I'm glad I have both girls and boys. They're I I don't know what I would do now without them. They're just wonderful. I, I when I sit and hear the women where I am living say, oh, I just have one child, that's enough for me, or this sort of thing, you know. I think, oh, you you poor lady. My women, my children are the most important thing to me in the world. The Lord has blessed me so much. How can I not bear my testimony? Uh, my patriarchal blessing is a wonderful blessing. It gives me wonderful... Um, promises, and uh, I hope I am keeping the promises. Any other final thoughts? I think everyone's heard enough from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Two. this has been great. Okay, let's go ahead and cut then. Well, Thanks, everybody. What a, Thanks, Grandma. But what a, a compliment to want to to do this with us.